welcome to this uh, advanced reinforced concrete design again we are in the module we are talking about uh, serviceability crack weight and design for bond we are in the third part of this uh, module uh, 9 we are going to look at what is bond and why is it important and how to design for bond so the expected learning outcomes after the student goes through this video the student should be able to explain the fundamentals of bond what is the bond mechanism and we have different types of failure modes that happen in bond so the student should be able to differentiate different types of failures and uh, the student should be able to calculate the development length for the given section and for the reinforcement details that are given and finally we will also uh, discuss uh, the different types of bar splices that are available Right. Let's look into what is bond and why it is really required. And uh, let's look at the fundamentals of bond. So, what is bond? Okay, the bond is the uh, force that is developed between the bar and the surrounding concrete. Only if you have interfacial stresses that are developing between the surface of the bar and the concrete, then in bending assumptions, in bending theory. We have assumed that plane sections remain plane, and uh, we also assumed that the strain in the embedded reinforcing bar is assumed to be same as that of what you have in the surrounding bar. So this will happen only if bond exists between the concrete and the reinforcing steel, right? So it is essential that the bond force is developed on the interface between concrete and steel so that slip will not occur at the interface. Okay. So the slip will not occur and everything will act in a composite manner and then only your strain distribution linear strain distribution assumption is actually it will be valid all right so in this case we will take a simple beam simply supported beam that is subjected to two point loads like this okay and if you look at the bending moment diagram for this beam you know that it is going to be like this okay it is going to vary linearly okay up to certain length right and then it is going to go like this and we know what is this value depending upon this let's say it is let's we take this as let's say l by 3 right so then this is going to be you know that it is going to be uh, p into l by 3 so it is going to be p l by 3 okay so this magnitude is also same right so this is your bending moment diagram now let us look at the bending moment is changing along the length of the b so if i take a small elemental length dx between sections a and b then let's look at the free body diagram and look at what are the forces in concrete and steel on the left side and right side that is on section a and section b so if you look at it uh, at let's say section a you have some bending moment like this and at section B, you have bending moment like this. So this, let's say this is M1 and this is M2, right? So you know that M2 is greater than M1. So that is the reason here we are saying that and shear is going to be constant. From shear pose diagram, we know shear is constant. So that is the reason we are putting this bending moment, let's say as M. And this increased bending moment is actually M plus DM. So the difference between M2 and M1 that what we have drawn that I am taking here as DM. The change in moment between the two sections which are spaced at a distance of DX as DM. Right? For the moment on the left side at section A, we know that we are going to develop compression force in concrete and tension force in steel. And the compression force and tension force has to be in equilibrium. C should be equal to T. And the distance between them, the lever arm, is what is generating that moment resistance for the bending moment that exists. Similarly, when I go to the next section at B, now I have bending moment of M plus DM. So that M is higher than the section that we have considered at A. Right? So the force in the steel should increase to T plus DT. And similarly, the compression force should increase to C plus DC because the moment has increased, right? So 
uh, and if you look at uh, the bar force so that's what we said one side we have t another side we have t plus dt now when i look at every as a section it should when you take the free body diagram equilibrium has to be satisfied now if i take only the bar between the length dx that what we have considered right this is dx right so if you look at the bar bar only we know that the bar is in tension on the uh, left side you have force of t on the right side you have an increase force of t plus dt and there is a variation in increase in tension uh, for a distance of dx now to satisfy this horizontal force equilibrium now the dt has to be uh, has to be equaled by the stresses that, that are developing on the interface of the bar around the perimeter for a length dx right so now if you look at it in the cross section so this entire force if we call this force as let's say uf which is your bond force that bond force is going to be acting all around the perimeter of the bar in this case we have taken only one bar if you have multiple bars you will have on all the perimeter this bond uh, force or stress will develop right so if you have multiple number of bars then we have to look at the perimeter summation of o here o is called, uh, considered the perimeter for one single bar so you do the perimeter calculation for all the bars right so again if you look at this portion now the next example what we are looking at it is now if you look at the portion cd that is from the right support to d again you find that c is the end of the support where bending moment is zero so the force on the bar is going to be tension force on the bar is going to be zero here right but however at the location d i am developing some moment okay which is again equal to pl by 3 for that i need to develop some force t right so one side zero another side some force tension t now again for to keep the bar in equilibrium bond stresses will develop right now this bond stresses because it's a n surface the bond will be zero here and it will keep on increasing okay and it will reach a high value very close to that of tension force so in this way only that i have to integrate that bond force that is acting around the perimeter over a length of dx that should equate to this tension force that what i need to develop to resist this applied bending moment in this cross section so in this way i need to develop some interfacial stresses around the bar then only it will help to satisfy the equilibrium when the bar forces are changing between two different sections right now let us look at how the bond strength is getting developed what are the sources for developing this bond strength now one is uh, the moment we put concrete the cement starts hydrating with all the other ingredients and then there is going to be an adhesion between the rebar and the concrete surrounding concrete so this is because of formation of your uh, calcium silicate hydrogels and it is like a gum like property during formed during hydration and there is also going to be the surfaces are going to be rough there is going to be mechanical friction between the steel and concrete surface at the interface in addition to that when the bar is trying to achieve the tension there is going to be some amount of slip and deformation so the slip induced interlocking uh, will also help uh, in producing this bond strength so because the surfaces are not smooth so you're going to have natural roughness of the bar with the concrete that is also going to produce an interlocking forces that is going to help in increasing the bond strength the most important thing is these things will happen these uh, three things will happen for a smooth bar also but nowadays we are always using deformed bar what is a deformed bar we have studied in the material chapter deformed bar is the one that has the ribs there are protrusions on the surface of the bar that is going to help us in improving the bond strength so they are basically uh, they provide bond force via shoulders of projecting ribs which bear on the surrounding concrete so you know the surface the ribs are not going to be uniform it is going to be at discrete space so they are going to project and it is going to uh, put some bearing stresses on the surrounding concrete in addition to that we can also provide end anchorages okay i can provide a l bent or a u bent and you hooks and also we can transfer the force in the form of an arch right by providing a tied arch action even if the bond is broken if my anchorage is pretty good 
still i can transfer the forces by only by end anchorages in case of a tide arch action so we will see that so let's say force in the steel t is let's say m max by z so for example in this case okay again for the same beam it's simply supported now when i keep on increasing the load you have a lot of this crack that forms the moment crack forms at the crack location there is no physical contact between the bar and the concrete section so bond stress is going to be zero when you have several cracks formed and then when you have longitudinal cracks like this splitting cracks are formed then you cannot really develop bond at the interface because the interface is completely damaged in that case the only way i can transfer the force is by forming this kind of an arch okay where the concrete is going to it will form a strut or an arch that is going to help in resisting compression but however at this interface you need to have equal and thigh to balance that component of this compression force right so but this will be possible only when you have these uh, ties are sufficiently anchored otherwise it cannot take the thing and you will have a slippage failure at the nodes where the ties and struts are connecting now in this way also for the maximum bending moment can be produced and the tension force on this bar will remain constant okay so because now you have formed a tied arch okay so the tension force along the length of the bar here it is going to be remaining constant and this force is going to be maximum moment divided by the lever arm which is the distance between the center of the strut and the steel ring arm right now let us look at uh, let us develop relationship between shear in the cross section and the bond okay again i am taking the same cross section between a and b and the distance between these two points is dx which we have discussed okay when you look at the force on the left side i have moment of m and then on the right side i have moment of m plus dm and the moment is increase for the loading that what we have considered right and shear is remaining constant so shear on the left and right side is going to be a remaining constant similarly when you look at the free body diagram we have seen that only the bar so this is only bar okay so only bar so when you look at only bar on the left side i have a force of tension t on the right side it is increased to t plus dt but then for this bar to be in equilibrium i will have some bond stress like this right so right so these are the bond stress that we talked about so u is we will talk about that is a bond stress it is a local average bond stress and we will uh, talk about what is the flexural bond stress and local average bond stress and uh, other things so now let's uh, look at uh, if i look at what should be dt now the tension force is increased from if i uh, so if i take the moment differences so if between the left and right then you have an additional moment of dm that has to be resisted by the force dt that is developed now dt multiplied by this lever arm which they take this lever arm as jd and this is let's say dt and this is dc right so d dm should be equal to the incremental tension force multiplied by the lever arm right okay so that so i can find an expression for increase in tension force like this the increase in bending moment divided by the lever arm jd now for the local equilibrium the change in bar force should be equal to bond force at the contact surface now what is a bond force at the contact surface so we have seen that the bond force is developing around the perimeter of the bar over a length of dx that what we have considered so if i take u as a local bond stress at one point and i multiply this for the entire perimeter i get for a one particular unit length what is the bond stress which will have unit of newton per millimeter when i integrate it over the length dx then i get that entire bond force that are developed on the periphery of the bar over a length of dx so that will be equal to dt right so then i can find an expression for your local average unit bond stresses the change in tension force divided by the summation of a perimeter multiplied by length so why we are taking summation if you have multiple number of bars then i need to calculate all the perimeters of all the bars that are there right so this is the expression for bond stress between the incremental change in your tension force on the bar 
now i want to relate this dt to shear okay so because dt is created by change in bending moment now change in bending moment over length you know that it is equal to shear now how do we relate that so if you look at it okay dt is in this expression we have calculated that dt is equal to dm by jd the incremental bending moment divided by the lever arm is change in your tension force in that way so dt can be replaced as dm by jd like this okay and again rest of the things i keep it so in this way i can relate the local bond stress to change in bending moment okay now what is dm by dx we know from basic strength of materials now this dm by dx is nothing but your shear the presence of shear is what is uh, or the change in bending moment is what it is creating shear right so uh, in this case then you can relate local bond stress to what is the change in shear that is acting in the cross section so dm by dx is your change in your shear right so that is basically we can relate that as v is equal to dm by dx okay so this is vm v is equal to dm by dx so now this is summation of your perimeter and jd is your lever arm right so this is the way i can relate average local bond stress to shear that is acting in the particular cross section right now let us see what is the actual distribution of your flexural bond stress okay again we are looking at the same uh, beam which is subjected to two point load p and p at distance of let's say l by 3 and l by 3 and if you keep increasing this p then you are going to develop these kind of cracks and the crack distribution will keep increasing okay and go like this. so let's say when i put p is equal to some load then i get this bending moment distribution but at all the crack location we have seen uh, we have discussed that there is not going to be any physical uh, continuity between the concrete and crack so you cannot have any bond so all the crack locations okay so if you look at at this location at this location at this location you see that there is not going to be bond stress the bond stress this is the variation of your bond stress the bond stresses are going to be zero at the crack location now at again at all the crack location you now if you look at it the the concrete we have seen the tension stiffening effect when we are discussing the crack width the calculations right and also in deflection calculations so your concrete between the cracks is going to actually contribute in tension so that has to be taken into account right so if you look at the variations of your steel stress okay wherever you have cracks like this there i'm going to have maximum value okay so there i'm going to have maximum value of your tension stress because at the crack location there is no concrete only steel has to take all the force to satisfy moment equilibrium right so at all the crack location you will going to have very high tension stress on the rebound now if i move away and if i look at uh, let's say uh, at this location between the crack okay at this location now at this cross section for the applied bending moment the section is uncracked so the concrete is also going to contribute in tension right so that is what if you look at it the concrete contribution in tension is also going to vary like this right again at all the crack location i am not going to have these are all the crack location so concrete cannot contribute because already it is cracked but between the cracks your concrete can contribute in tension so wherever i am having maximum force in tension at that location concrete is not doing because it is already cracked but however between the maximum locations wherever the concrete is maximum you find that the stress in the steel is going to be lower right so because of this variation in your tension stress in your steel and also the cracks are formed the bond stresses are going to change its direction so that's why we call these bond stresses as in and out bond stresses okay this is because the concrete between the cracks is also helping in tension resistance and at crack locations 
previously what we have considered was uh, the average monsters considering that between the two sections there are no cracks the moment in reinforced concrete when you have cracks the monsters distribution is going to be in and out the monsters however close to the crack location if you look at this magnitude it is going to have a very high bond at this location only at the crack location it is going to have bond stress of zero but if you just look at it adjacent to the crack you are going to have a very high bond stress and when you integrate all these stresses it will not be zero there is going to be an average bond stress right so uh, concrete fails to resist tensile stresses only where the actual crack is located and steel t will be maximum let's say at this location m is a bending moment and stress is going to be and the force is going to be m by jd which is your lever arm now between the cracks again concrete does not resist does resist moderate amount of tension induced by bond and we have seen that the u the bond stress is proportional to the rate of change of bar force i think we have discussed that in the previous slide u is proportional to rate of change of this tension force now if the tension force on the bar is varying right so that is the reason we have u is proportional to the rate of change of bar force and highest where the slope of the steel force is greatest okay so wherever the slope force slope force slope is highest right or the slope of the force steel force curve is highest that is where you are going to have maximum bond stress so this is where it is right so and as we have discussed very high local bond stress will develop adjacent to the crack right so again you will have in and out stresses the, that means this uh, the direction of the bond stress will keep changing but when you integrate all of them still you will have average bond stress right now let us look at what are the bond stresses this is what happens in bending whenever you have change in tension and also with crack you will have this in and out bond stresses now let us look at what are the bond resistant mechanism now we have seen we are looking at a deformed bar so this is a deformed bar let's say this is subject to some tension force like this right when you look at only the free body diagram of concrete and these are your ribs these are basically your projections that you have it on the bar okay so these projections the concrete is going to uh, going to get in between the ribs and it is going to interlock so when you are subjecting this bar to tension you are going to develop this kind of forces okay the rib the concrete is going to put force like this so the addition usually we have seen uh, three mechanisms addition the friction and then you have bearing forces that are coming at the ribs right but when you when the tension force starts increasing adhesion and friction bond transfer mechanism will be quickly lost so the chemical addition between the concrete and steel and the friction will be lost okay and then leaving the bond to be transferred only by bearing on the deformations of the bar okay what are the deformation that are happening uh, when the bar is undergoing tension and that is going to bear against that surrounding concrete that bearing is what it is going to help in achieving the bond stress so this is one of the reasons the plain bars uh should not be used or you should be using using it very very carefully because the bond what you are going to develop is going to be very very less and nowadays uh, we are using traditionally uh, the deformed bars and now if you look at the free bar this is what happens in the bar okay so this is what happens in the bar now the same thing when i look at it what happens to the surrounding concrete so this is the empty space the white space is the space that is occupied by the bar now when i take away the bar and i look at only what is the stress of forces that are going to act on the concrete and you will find that it is at, at the interfaces of the ribs you you find that again the equilibrium has to be satisfied so if the bearing from concrete to steel is like this then uh, on the interface now the concrete will be subjected to bearing exactly opposite to the force what you have it in steel right so when you look at this uh, forces and when you try to resolve them you will get a longitudinal component and a radial component and the radial component is going to again both of them are going to go around the perimeter right so there are going to be equal and opposite bearing stresses going to act on the concrete and the forces on the concrete will have both longitudinal and a radial component okay this radial component what it will do is it will create a A circumferential tensile stresses, which is also called a splitting stresses, 
in the concrete around the bar okay because this is a radial force that is going to act and it is going to split the concrete okay so this concrete because when the stresses radial stresses are going to be much higher and higher then the concrete will split parallel to the bar and the resulting crack will propagate to the surface of the beam leading to overall bond failure right so this is the way the bond resisting mechanism what are the main mechanism it is a bearing of the rip against the surrounding concrete is what it is the major uh, bond uh, resistance mechanism adhesion and friction will be quickly lo lost once the tension force exceeds a certain value now this is these are the radial forces when you look at it again when you look at only the concrete this radial forces all of them right it is going to create just like in thin wall pressure vessel you have seen if it is going to be an internal pressure then the surrounding you are going to develop some hook tension so this hook tension is what it will create around the surface of the bar and it is going to split the concrete okay so that is what it will happen so the splitting crack actually follow the reinforcing bars along the bottom or side surfaces of the beam right